Okay, welcome everyone to the Northampton Urban Forestry Commission meeting this December 7th, 2022 at 4.33 p.m. Um, public comment period. Uh, there are members of the public. Is, does anyone have any questions or comments? No, none. Okay, great. Um, I, I just like to, oh, Molly, yes, go ahead. I just want to say for the record, now that we're recording, um, yes. that since it says Unitarian Society by my name, that's not who I'm representing. I'm Molly Hale. <laughs> I'm one of the just for the record. All right. We, we're okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, say hello to Elizabeth Barnes. She is joining us uh, this, this afternoon uh, to give us a really uh, hopefully insightful update on the spotted lanternfly and how MDAR is um, dealing with this invasive pest throughout the Commonwealth. Um, we have a few, um, and Elizabeth, we have a few um, um, house cleaning details, and then you'll have the floor for, uh, you know, we, I think I budgeted an hour, so, and with Q&A as well. So, um, thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll get back to you shortly. Uh, I sent out the minutes um, uh, with this package. I Folks, I don't know if you had a chance to read them. If you haven't, please take the time to read them and then we can, someone can make a motion to accept them or amend them. Yeah, give me a couple of minutes. Yeah, take your time. We're, we're doing fine. Um, I wanted to make a comment or clarify something in the in the minutes under the part about the STO. Um, it says um, it seems the DBH may be arbitrary. They decided the benefits of smaller trees are better than larger ones as they sequester more carbon. Um, did we actually say that? I don't think that's actually correct. And I, I got a comment from somebody, I got an email from somebody um, who saw the minutes and pointed that out. Or no, they were at the meeting, I think, or something anyway, is that? So I think the way we, what we, this is my, remember what we talked about is that you get a better bang for your buck for when younger tree, uh, younger trees for sequestering carbon in the long term. So this is one of the reasons why we did, we talked about actually reducing the DBH because of the fact that young trees can pack on more carbon and sequester more carbon than older trees can, depending upon their age and condition. So um, that's not really how it's reflected in there, but that's one of the reasons we wanted to capture the smaller DBH. And David, correct me if I'm wrong, but I... It may not have come out that way. In the I would years. say over the lifetime of the tree, that's probably true if you count up all the years ahead of that small tree and, and add them all up compared to a tree that's already old. But um, I think it's pretty established. And I know this is what Bob Leverett is always saying, that um, large trees, um, they sequester way more, way, way, way more carbon than um, like the same volume, I guess, of of smaller trees, like per year, I guess. So I think, I'm not sure that that fact is correct, that the one that's on the minutes. Well, you can always make a, you can always uh, just, we can change it however you want it to read. I mean, I, we'd have to go back in the recording to see exactly what was said, but that's. Right. Yeah. So what do we do if it was actually said, so it should be in the minutes, but. Then I'm not we, sure it's actually correct. Then someone would make a motion to table the accepting the minutes until we actually go back into the meeting and find out exactly what was said. That's what we would do. We wouldn't we wouldn't approve the minutes at this meeting. Mm. I guess that's what I would um, ask. Okay. Yeah, the wording that the DBH is arbitrary. I think just having that as a statement is problematic because it's kind of a little. Um, out of context because it's not I mean do you know what I'm trying to say like it's it needs to have a few more words in there to tell what is is it talking about 
as far as carbon sequestration or something. I, I don't know how to amend it, but it looks like we're saying DBH doesn't matter. And we, you know, it matters for a lot of things. And um, Sue Lofthouse is trying to get in. Did you? Maybe she's at the wrong link. I told her to go to the public yeah. link on the on the agenda. She's not in. She's not in the way. Oh, there she is. She finally showed up. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, if you give me access to the recording or tell me where I can find it, I would be willing to go back and listen to it and see what it actually says. And then, um, if it does say what what the minutes say, then um, I'd like to. Uh, hmm. I guess another get another opinion on whether that's true or not. Well, you could also make just not to be technical, you could just make a point of clarification. You know, you can make a point of clarification to to, to dispute that. I mean, it, I, I think again, it was probably taken as Jen said, sort of out of context, or it's not complete. The sense mm -hmm. is not complete with all the factual okay. information that was said because we we're going back and forth. So, okay. Yeah, let just let me know where I can find the recording. Okay, uh, I don't know, Bonnie. Have the re the recording for the last meeting been posted um, on uh, Northampton Media? I'm not sure if it was on Northampton Open Media, but I did submit it. Okay, I don't know if they've uploaded it yet. I can okay. check right now. Is that the name of a website, Northampton Open Media? Uh, yes. I'm done with the minutes. Okay, hold on. I'll just finish. I'll quickly finish looking through them. All right. Molly, I don't see it yet, so I can follow mm -hmm. up with them tomorrow. Okay. Um, but I may have the link as well. I don't know yeah. if it's appropriate that I just send it to you. Sure. I don't see why not. Okay. I can do Thank that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bonnie. Yep. Do you have my email? I will get it from... Okay. From Rich. Okay. Okay, I'm done. All right, I think uh, I'm finished as well. All right, so can I have any any other comments on the minutes other than Molly's comment? So how does how did how do we uh, how do we like approve the minute? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, what you actually you, say? you you don't approve the minutes. You just need someone to table hmm. table approval of these minutes until we actually look at. Uh, the video video recording to make sure what was what is written in the minutes is actually what was said. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's uh, what we, we since I brought it up, I'll I'll make that motion. I motion that we I move that we um, table the approval of last um, the last time's meeting until um, until the minutes are reviewed or the the video is reviewed to see if um, if it was characterized properly. The part about the um, Size of trees and carbon sequestration. I'll second that. That's Jen. All right. There's been a motion and seconded on the floor. Any discussion on the motion? No discussion. Bonnie, can you call the roll call, please? I can. Rich? Uh, yes. Susan? Yes. Molly? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. David? Yes. And no, Rob. No, I did. I did not hear from Rob, so I'm not exactly sure um, what uh, if he if he's coming or not. Uh, Jackie, you see yeah, your hands up. I found the link to the video. I'll send it to you right now. Thank you, you Jackie. Thank Molly, you. I don't have your address, but I'll send it to Rich. Yeah, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let me just pull up my. 
Okay, I don't have uh, much, I don't really have much to report. Um, I will tell you that I may not be available for our next meeting, which is the uh, 21st, I think. So I will have a discussion with Sue about that meeting. Um, if I'm not available, I'm not sure if we wanna have a meeting or if you, know, you could all meet without me and Sue could, uh, I could set, I think I could set Sue up with the Zoom link, but I'm not sure, but I will know more probably next week. So I will be in touch. Thank you. Um, yep. The other thing I wanted to um, let you know is that I did a little preliminary work uh, with Dave Bloniars from uh, U.S. Forest Service, uh, who's that, his office is like everywhere, but mainly down, I think it's in Amherst, but it's also with his office in Springfield. He did an eye tree canopy cover assessment for us, and this is not on the agenda, but I just wanted to bring this to your attention. He did an eye tree canopy cover assessment um, as far back as 1995. So I will share this. Let me just do a screen share. Uh, let's see if you can see this. Share. Can everybody see that screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So this is using Google Earth imagery uh, that Dave has access to from March of 1995. All these data points in here are points where he actually, they've surveyed for the canopy cover. Hmm. Um, and I'm going to just scroll down here quickly. Um, as you can see, there is the different types of covered, um, the di different types of land cover, you know, herbaceous grass, impervious buildings, impervious others, impervious road, bare soil, and uh, tr tree and shrub, which is this tall one here, which has us above 60%. Um, and if you scroll down to the second page, we'll just go right down to the uh, tree and shrub. Right here uh, in 1995, according to this, we were 63.25% canopy cover. If you, if you go to, um, uh, in 2022, this was as 1118, 2022, using the same data points in the same places. Now you have to remember too, that these data points are in the same place and they're very heavily, they're all over uh, like the ward six and seven. So there's a lot of canopy cover there to begin with. And there still is tr a tremendous amount of canopy cover there today. Um, and we ended up with um, very similar numbers, but um, tree and shrub is at 63%. Hmm. Plus or minus 2.41%. So this again is generalized. It's over the whole city. It's not in any particular ward. Um, so it's it's I think um I'm gonna I'm gonna pursue this angle with uh, Dave Bloniers to actually get us some more data hmm. that is actually more in the urban areas of the city by ward. So hopefully I'll have a little more information. Um that we can have for part of our discussion. I know that Sue also probably uh, has uh, been work, has been speaking to Kent. Is that his name, Sue? Kent? Yes, Kent Johnson, who yeah. worked with Green Cambridge and Andrew Putnam on mapping yeah. to get their numbers. So um, I think it would be really helpful to have data that um, actually looks at um, the individual wards uh, because there's not necessarily a tremendous amount of development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Rich. Rich. Rob is waiting to get I, in. I let him in. Okay. He, he should be coming in. So thanks. So that, Sorry. That's okay. Individual ward, you were saying we do not yeah. have that. No, we don't have that kind of again, the data points are all similar um, in at the similar places. So I mean there's a large area here in the meadows that has no canopy cover. There's a large area up here in Leeds, uh, in the uh um Yankee Hill area, there's a large, you know, all the whole Western, almost the Western third of the city right here is a lot of uh, canopy cover, um, you know, but I think it would be interesting to have, we need more information, but that's just something that he was able to do based on his uh, ability to, to uh, access satellite data at, the, at, the, at his level at US Forest Service. So, ah. What year did you say the first one was done? 1995. 
So uh, I'm going to stop sharing because, uh, but I, we were definitely going to continue this conversation in more depth. I think I'm, I'm going to meet with Kent um, at some point, probably after the first of the year um, to have a discussion about what he can bring to the table for us. So we can maybe uh, approach this at a few different ang angles. So we have some concrete information and can kind of guide us into the into a, the direction we think we need to go. I think an important uh, a current emphasis, just to make sure we cover it, is base date between 1995 and now. Yep. I think that would be a pretty important uh, just piece of data to look at. Yep. Given the recent changes that are happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's why it's it would be interesting to have the data by ward. Yeah. You know, so that'll require a little bit of work on my part with him. Yes, uh, Molly. Um. Well, it's interesting if he uses the same data, but just basically uses a subset that only includes the downtown wards. Mm -hmm. um, it might not have enough data points to be statistically significant, and we might need to add data points. And I'm wondering if it looks like a fairly simple thing to do is you just generate random points and then look at the map and classify each point according to certain criteria. Maybe um, one of us could, maybe I could do that myself if I have the instructions. Okay. I think what Kent does is he goes to something called M, well, this is what he told me, MRLC, which is where the Forest Service data comes from. Oh. And it's rather, he said it's a rather coarse resolution. He should speak to this better than I can hmm. by far. And it's complex. I He demonstrated a little bit of it to me, the different ways you can look at it, look at the data and um, and parse it. But um, he does have a lot of experience with this tree data. And hmm. again, worked with Andrew Putnam hmm. on it. So um, we could loop you in, Molly, if you're yeah. interested. Yeah, loop me in. Yeah, yeah, OK. All right. Any other questions? None. OK, thank you. Um, so I reserve the rest of today's meeting um, to have a uh, presentation on spider lanternfly. And our guest speaker is Elizabeth Barnes, who is the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator for MDAR, uh, actually Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator for Crop and Pest Services under MDAR. I got to get that right. Oh, quite, quite a title. Wonderful news. So, um, the Forestry Commission has oh. data that they you can oh. use. That's all right. I just muted Jackie. That's okay. okay. <laughs> just uh, so Elizabeth, um, welcome and thank you for taking the time to uh to come and speak to us. We're really interested in this uh subject matter and we really would like to try to figure out the um, how we could uh, ass assist if we can, if uh, or if we need to go in a different direction. We've done a little bit of uh, we've done a little bit of of work. I think Molly uh, Molly Hale, if you want to just speak to what we've done uh, so far, as far um, as sure. Mostly, what we've done is um, tried to uh, we've started mapping where all the tree of heavens are, the ailanthus trees in Northampton, and we've we haven't finished, but. Um, we have found some specific um, um, patches where where it is, um, and a lot of the city. It's good there isn't any, but there are a few places where there are. Uh, there's a little population of them, and um, uh, that's basically what we've done. With, uh, since that's one of the main hosts, um, and we've also discussed in this meeting, like, well, what would we actually do with that data? Is that actually useful or not really? Since it has other hosts too. Um, um, you know, just trying to figure out if there's ways that that information could be, give us a leg up on things. It's it's funny that you say that because that's actually something I was going to talk about. We have um, an iNaturalist project. And as part of that, we're asking people to report both Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly um, because um, it does... Well, I mean, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more, but um, it does, 
prefer Tree of Heaven. So usually it'll show up on Tree of Heaven or Grapevines first. Um, so there, there are ways that you can use that for monitoring. It isn't, of course, guaranteed that that's where it'll show up first because this insect loves to defy expectations. Um, but it, it is useful data to have. Um, I, should, I just want to quick also mention that Molly contacted our uh, Agriculture Commission within mm -hmm. Northampton and they kind of knew about its body of lantern fly, but didn't think it was related to them. So um, I think it was a, a great outreach and, um, you know, we can continue to connect with them and give them information, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that would be great. Um, it, it certainly, I mean, I think it, it depends on the crops, but there are definitely, um, sectors of agriculture where it's going to have a, a really big impact potentially. We do have, um, we have one vineyard, mm -hmm. at least one vineyard in town, and we have um, one pretty substantial maple syrup producer. Mm -hmm. um, do you, so it sounds like you, you have a, a good deal more background than I was honestly expecting uh, coming in, which is, <laughs> which is great, but I just, um, I don't know, would it be useful for you, for me to, I, I have a presentation that I can give, would it be useful for me to sort of really just um, skim through like the ID information I have, but really yes. focus more in yeah. on actual, like the effects yes. it's having in treatment. Okay. Yeah, I can yes. do that. Yeah. Uh, let me just. And then we have some questions that we came up with um, that we'd love to ask you afterwards. Sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Um, let me just. Okay. I've shifted my talk over. Um, one thing I, I will mention that I've I've skipped over entirely on here. Um, at this time of year, we're not seeing any more live adult spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts. It's really in the egg mass stage, but it's worth continuing to keep an eye out for the adults because they can hitchhike from southern states still. And we actually, um, a couple of years ago, we had someone report a dead adult in a poinsettia plant. Um, so they can come in that way. They're still active in the, the southern states where it's a bit warmer. But that said, let me share my screen. All right, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna be turning because I've got two screens and the PowerPoint's on the screen over here. Um, so the, the impact on plants. So spotted lanternfly, they're a sap feeding insect. So they have this straw-like mouth part that they stick into plants. Um, there's some, um, early results that we're seeing that that may actually end up causing small amounts of damage in the tissue of the plant itself, where it's actually sticking its um, little beak in there. Um, but those are early data, and most of the damage that we've seen so far has been due to just the volume of sap that they're able to drink, because there's so many on a single tree. Um, they will shift their host plants over the course of the year. So if you are um, looking to monitor for them, um, they will feed on grape, tree of heaven the entire year. Those are their per, like really strongly preferred host plants. But that said, uh, they will feed on a, a wide variety of other things. Earlier in the summer, they're going to be on um, smaller plants that have thinner bark and are easier for them to actually drink out of. And then later in the summer, they switch over to larger trees that have that higher volume of um, sap, but might have slightly thicker bark. And then it's not in this chart, but even later in the year into October, late October, November, they'll switch on to um, some, some additional host plants as well that just continue being active later in the year, whereas say Tree of Heaven kind of goes dormant around October usually, so that shifts. And um, also, I mean, I, I'm sure you've come across this information before, but this is just a list of the things that you're most commonly seeing them feed on in Pennsylvania. We have found them feeding on over a hundred different types of host plants. Um, they will feed on just about anything. They can't necessarily do it long term, but they will try to feed on just about anything from you know very small um, herbaceous plants all the way up to trees. The things that they 
seem like they can actually manage to feed on are pretty much restricted to evergreens. Um, and it seems as though they can't actually feed on milkweed, that the, the latex in there is a problem for them. It, it probably gums up their mouth parts, but nobody's tested that for sure in the lab. Um, when they are feeding, most of the damage is connected to wilting on the trees, but it's going to be different depending on the species of trees and the number of lanternfly feeding on the plant. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is related to really, really high levels of feeding um, that you tend to get once they've reached outbreak conditions. For Tree of Heaven, Black Walnut, sumac and grapes, they can actually kill these plants. Uh, tree of Heaven, Black Walnut and sumac, uh, you have a couple years of heavy feeding and you can have saplings dying um, and uh, you know smaller sort of medium sized trees can lose substantial branches. Now, of course, Tree of Heaven, it, it, who cares? It's an invasive plant. If they would just take care of them for us, it would actually be a good thing. Um, but Black Walnut and sumac, we certainly would prefer they not have this impact on. Um, grapes, they can kill in a single season. You get massive numbers of lantern flies on the grapevines that are closest to the edge of the field. That does taper off a little bit towards the center of the plot, but they're still having a really heavy impact on those grapes. Uh, the vines that they don't kill, they um, affect the plant in such a way that the grapes, they don't taste very good. You can't really sell them. You can't use them for much of anything. So it's a, it's a very big problem for the vineyards. Talking to people in Pennsylvania, what they are recommending at the moment for vineyards is to um, really look into what management strategies are going to work for them um, and sort of have a plan in place for dealing with the lanternfly when they get there. Um, of course, oh, and this is, again, something I, I would have mentioned at the beginning, we're always finding out something new. I got an email yesterday where it was some interesting new thing that somebody learned about lanternfly that's going to help us manage them better. Um, this insect has really only been in uh, North America for a few years. It's behaving differently here in both its native range and in other places that it's invaded in the past. Um, so there's a lot we have to learn. And I strongly recommend that, you know, if you do have to deal with it in the future, this is the latest information right now, but still get in touch with us or do um, other research on your own to figure out what the best strategy is gonna be for you. Okay. Um, now, all the other host plants that they're feeding on. Again, we can see wilting of the host plant, um, but what they're primarily doing is acting as a plant stressor. If the plant is totally healthy on its own, that's probably going to be fine. The plant is going to be able to recover that. It's going to be able to take that stress. But if you combine that with something else like disease, drought, um, construction, that's disturbing the soil around the plant, um, that's a particular problem in urban areas. Um, other insects feeding on it, um, and if you potentially, if you have many, many, many years of that really heavy feeding, which we do see on some trees, that's when we're gonna, we, we think we're gonna start to see more issues for those plants. So, um, but again, it's still a new enough impact that, uh, uh, insect that we don't know for sure what the really long-term impacts of it will be. Now, there are secondary effects of it as well. Um, spotted lanternfly, when they feed, they consume more sap than they can actually um, use. They drink more water and sugar in particular than their body can process. And so they get rid of it. Um, they key it out. It's the only way to say it as this sticky substance called honeydew. It's basically sugar water. If you've ever had an aphid outbreak on your plants, you'll notice there's like some sticky stuff under it. That's honeydew. So you're taking those aphids and you're scaling them up to a very large insect, but keeping around the same density of that insect. Um, I have been uh, down to the Springfield site. I've taken some pictures down there. I was desperately trying to shield my camera lens because it was like, it feels like there's this light drizzle of like soda coming down on you. It's, it's really awful. Um, that honeydew also attracts stinging insects. There's all sorts of stinging insects that really love it. I've actually seen a yellow jacket and a hornet fighting each other for direct access to a spotted lanternfly. And someone I was talking to from Pennsylvania was telling me he saw uh, a hornet actually kill a yellow jacket and then just go straight back to that lanternfly. So they really like the honeydew. You get large numbers of them there. 
um, which you might not think is a big problem until you start thinking about those insects in people's yards or those insects in public places where people are trying to relax. Now, uh, you also will sometimes see weeping from the trees and occasionally this buildup of this, it's like a, a foamy froth at the base of the trees. Um, it will ferment and um, particularly on a tree of heaven when you get this, it has this rancid peanut butter and alcoholic smell to it that you can smell a good distance away. Um, and that like rancid peanut butter smell, if you've ever like scratched at tree of heaven, that's where it's coming from tree of heaven, it smells awful. Um, so th this, is, this is another problem. Now we don't know exactly how that's affecting the tree at the moment, but it does affect the people who are trying to spend time around the tree. Another effect of spotted lanternfly is the sooty mold. Um, the the uh, honeydew, it's a sugary surface that allows this growth of this sooty mold. Um, that can end up on the understory and really anything underneath the trees. And uh, here's a, a close up of a leaf. It can block photosynthesis, um, which can be a problem for the plants in the understory um, under heavy feeding sites where the sooty mold is. And um, it, it can also be an issue in more urban areas where someone might have something planted under the tree. So, you know, sometimes people will have flowers arranged under a tree. Those flowers get covered in sooty mold. That's not gonna be good for them. And also an issue for people's property. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a stairway in someone's house. The top two uh, steps are still covered in that honeydew with black sooty mold. You can see it's a darker color and it's kind of shiny. It's also sticky and it can be slippery as well. So if that's on stairs, slippery, that's a big issue. And in order to get rid of it, this person actually had to power wash that bottom step. So when it gets on there, it tends to really stick in place. It's hard to remove. So when you kind of combine all of this together, in addition for being a, a potential issue for tree health, it's also a problem for people using, you know, outdoor spaces, natural areas. Um, they can land on people. They, they're not that bright. Um, you know, I love insects, but not many <laughs> insects are. So they see people, this, this tall standing object, and they think we're trees. So they'll land on us, and then they will climb up us. Um, they also attract um, stinging insects from that honeydew. Again, you get a whole bunch of stinging insects in an area that's an issue. There's also some discussion about whether or not that will be a problem for beekeepers because honeybees are certainly one of the stinging insects that collect the honeydew. Um, and some people in Pennsylvania say that changes the flavor of the honey they're producing. Um, sticky surfaces. So those steps, if they're sticky, slippery, benches, railings, uh, your car, uh, in this picture, you can see there's some uh, like a little toy car over there and a, a wagon out back. Um, all of those, if they were left there, could get covered in honeydew. And there's, I, I wish I had a video in here. I should have added one in. I, I really can't emphasize how much honeydew you actually end up with. And it comes like shooting out in these little spurts from the lantern flies. So it gets a, not a huge distance around, but a decent little circle around the trees. Another potential issue is with agritourism. Um, at first, there was some concern about what it was going to do, the lanternflies would do to the health of apple trees and other fruit trees. So far, we're not seeing a big issue with that in the US. They had issues in Korea with it, but in the US, you know, we don't know why, but it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem. However, there's a lot of pick your own orchards in New England. And uh, spotted lanternfly, you get the peak of the adults, which are, you know, the flying mobile stage around the same time as people are going out to pick apples. So that's in late August and September. If you have an orchard with a bunch of lanternfly in them, and we certainly have seen swarms of lanternfly entering orchards, you have these insects buzzing around people's heads. You have them producing all this honeydew. Um, even if you are uh, choose to, to kill them, I, I don't know how many of you have ended up having to deal with like large numbers of dead rotting insects. When I was in grad school, I did a few times. So uh, I have certainly experienced it and they smell awful. So if you're just running a farm purely for producing the apples, selling the apples, that might not be a big deal. But if you were someone who's trying to have people come into your orchard and enjoy their time there, 
having these lanternfly ruin that experience might be a big issue for you. It might make them not want to come back. They might tell their friends, their friends might not want to come. So that's a, another area where sort of these unexpected impacts of lanternfly. Now we get asked a lot, okay, does anything eat them? <laughs> Yes and no. So uh, ants will eat them, spiders will eat them, stink bugs eat them, birds eat them, all sorts of things will eat them, but they don't eat enough to actually cause a big difference in their um, population size. You really need specialized predators. Um, that's what keeps, or part of what keeps many insect populations in check. You can think of those little cocoons you might sometimes find on tomato hornworms. Um, those are a type of parasitoid. They're specialized on tomato hornworms. You need something similar for lanternfly to knock down their population. So to that end, in the long term, there is a project to try and find a biocontrol agent, um, which is uh, these tiny little stingless wasps. Um, sometimes you can use flies as well that are found in their native range. Um, we've collected two potential parasitoids so far uh, while uh, working with researchers in China. Uh, they are not ready for release yet. This is really potentially a long-term solution. If lanternfly spreads, it would hopefully at least knock down their population to manageable numbers so that we could live with them here. Um, we still need to know a lot first though. We need to know how to rear them. We also need to make sure they're not gonna impact any of our native insects. Nobody wants that. There's a ton of testing that we need to do first to make sure that there aren't gonna be any of these unexpected effects from them. But that is something that's being worked on right now as a potential solution in the future. Um, there are also um, a couple, well, actually there's, more funguses to add to the list now. Um, there, there are several native fungi that affect spotted lanternfly. Um, this is also promising. Um, we might be able to apply it to say an area where we're trying to knock down spotted lanternfly numbers. Um, it wouldn't completely kill all of the lanternfly, but it might um, you know, at least suppress the population to manageable levels. Again, though, this is nowhere near ready to actually be applied. They're still doing um, trials to see how effective it actually is. Um, lanternfly is tricky because even if you, say, get rid of 50% one day, uh, particularly in the adult stage, you can just have more coming in from the surrounding area. Um, also, again, same thing as with the parasitoids I just talked about. Before we're doing this or recommending it to people, we need to make sure it's not going to have effects on native insects that are going to be um, seriously harmful. Um, you know, I, I'm a bug person. I love bugs. That's how I got into this. So it's, you know, it's something I care about. It's something that the people who research this care about as well. Okay, so they're spread. Um, unfortunately, they are very, very good at hitchhiking. Um, their egg masses are incredibly difficult to spot. I'll show you some pictures of those in a few minutes. Um, and they do um, often hide them. So they, the egg masses can spread. And when you have an, an egg mass transported to a new area, that's 30 to 50 lanternfly hatching out the following spring. That is enough to start a new population of them. They're also pretty mobile. Um, so once you get, um, so they can first off, jump onto cars, cling onto cars. They, they've got strong little legs. So even at you know, 30, 40 miles an hour, they can be clinging to the outside of cars. Um, and they tend to prefer sort of edge areas, disturbed habitats, fields, urban areas. All of these are places where people tend to go a lot. They're not an insect that we find, say, you know, deep out in, in the thick woods. Their area is where you know, in industrial sites where there's say tree of heaven growing along the side or um, downtown, they had them in New York uh, this fall. I, you may have seen it on the news and a lot of the, the like TV shows coming out of New York, they were all talking about it. That's where they like to be, which gives them the opportunity to hitch a ride on people. People can move them a lot further than they can go on their own. Now, a few of the transport pathways. Um, any sort of um, thing that's being kept outside, they will lay their eggs on. Um, that includes things like benches. Uh, if this person took this bench, I, I mean, that bench looks pretty weathered. <laughs> you, might, you might take a different bench than that, but if someone were to take some sort of like bench they had outside to a new spot, um, if they're moving to a different state, those lanternfly eggs are coming with them. So people who are moving long distances, that's a potential issue. Um, and that includes people who are moving for college. 
Um, people, if you're outside, again, the lantern fly can land on you. If you've got a female that's ready to lay eggs on your shoulder, she goes in the car with you, hops out in the new place. I know it sounds unlikely, but these they're, they're sneaky. They don't know that they're being sneaky, but they can be sneaky. Um, just a little side note here, lanternfly don't bite. They're not strong enough to actually pierce our skin, but they, they've got little claws on their feet. And so when they climb up people, sometimes people think that they're biting them because they feel this sort of prickly feeling. They're not gonna break your skin, but it is unnerving. It can be scary. So you can get you know call, more calls in for people who are freaked out that they think there's you know, going to catch something from the lantern fly or something like that. The lantern fly aren't biting them though. They're just, if you're not a bug person, it can be gross. And even if you're a bug person, like I don't like unexpected insects crawling up my neck either. Um, all right. The, the next potential vector is firewood. This is a big one. Um, firewood can move um, many, many different types of invasive insects. It's why there's such a huge don't move firewood campaign. Um, lantern fly can lay their eggs on them. We are, when, we're, when we're saying don't move firewood, we're not talking about, say you have a woodlot in Amherst and you live in Northampton, cut down your, uh, your firewood in Amherst, bring it back to your house in Northampton. It's probably not gonna be an issue. Like I can't guarantee you're not gonna spread something that way, but it's, it's a small enough distance that there's a good chance that if an insect is in one town, it's probably gonna be in another. What you don't wanna do is take firewood from Northampton and bring it up to, you know, New Hampshire, or even take it and bring it, I mean, I don't know why you would necessarily, well, bring it down to Boston. I guess maybe, <laughs> maybe there are a few people that might be bringing it that far, but that's the sort of distance that we're concerned about. Uh, another potential vector is from the nursery industry, um, and this is particularly concerning if you're going to be planting, you know, new street trees. A lot of um, plants are actually grown in different states. Even if you're getting it from a no local nursery, they may be having stuff brought in because it just, it'll grow better in other states. So they start it there and then bring it to the nearby nursery. Um, there are all sorts of rules about um, treatments you need to do on those plants before you can ship them out, inspections you need to do. But even so, every now and then something slips through the cracks or there could be you know, an, an infestation people don't know about that ends up uh, with some eggs on a nursery plant that gets moved to a new area. Um, so what I, I would suggest if you have, you know, the time to do it, inspect those plants as much as you can to make sure that there are no egg masses on them, just to make sure you're not accidentally planting a tree with a bunch of spotted lanternfly on it as well. Um, vehicles are another big vector. Um, they can, again, like I said before, they can cling onto cars. They will also go in the wheel wells. Um, they will lay their eggs in those wheel wells. And so if the car is parked there at the spring at hatch time, again, lantern flies hatching out of it. Uh, this is one of the reasons why there's been such a push to kind of get the word out at big transport hubs. So shipping areas, um, even, you know, something like the postal service, not to like call them out or anything there it's just that lanternfly aren't picky they could lay their eggs on them and if again if the truck is there at the right time those eggs could hatch at that time uh and then finally um i separate out trains from other other vehicles because there are many many um uh railroads where you have tree of heaven along the sides uh, in Pennsylvania, I've talked to people who've, again, said that um, they've seen lantern flight, they climb up the tree of heaven, they jump off and glide, and they're landing right on those train cars, which are going who knows where. So along railroads, um, that's that's a big place, again, to look for spotted lantern flight, although um, you need to work with the railroads. You can't go out there by yourself. There's all sorts of rules about that. I, I, I don't mean to recommend anyone go do that themselves. Um, if, if you want to, please talk to the rail lines. Um, okay, so where is the potential distribution? So this map shows in uh, the red, these are areas where they have high suitability for habitat. The yellow is medium, green is low, and white is unsuitable. So there's a couple places in the northern part of the Midwest that don't have to deal with it, but the rest of us do. Uh, you'll notice in Massachusetts that most of the state is medium habitat suitability, but there's this stripe right up the center of high habitat suitability that goes right through the valley. 
Uh, so they were predicting that they're going to really like it here. And that is based on things like availability of host plants and also the, the climate in those areas. Uh, there's there's a little bit of space over in the Berkshires that um, it, we don't expect them to like. But other than that, uh, we, we're predicting that they will be able to establish in Massachusetts. So where are they? Um, oh, I meant to switch out this map this morning. It hasn't changed much since October. Um, <laughs> This map shows the areas in blue are counties where spotted lanternfly has an established population, and the red diamonds are places where there were individual spotted lanternfly found, were found. The big takeaways here, first off, you'll notice there's this high density of counties with lanternfly. This is right around where the lanternfly was first found, but there's also areas, you know, over in Indiana, in Michigan, um, individual finds in New Hampshire and Vermont, not established populations, but they found hitchhikers up there, um, where the lanternfly is showing up. Those are totally disconnected to the other counties with lanternfly, which suggests that yes, they did hitch a ride on something like a vehicle, firewood, one of those means that I mentioned earlier. Um, they are very good at hitchhiking. I can't emphasize this enough. This is the latest map for Massachusetts. You can actually find this map on um, our pest dashboard website. It also shows Asian longhorn beetle there and emerald ash borer, kudzu. And then there's a town by town that shows the list by town. And we're planning on adding um, more insects and more invasive plants in the future, but this is just as far as we've gotten so far. Uh, so this map shows in blue municipalities that had an individual find of lanternfly but don't have a population present, and in orange those are existing populations of lanternfly. Uh, that includes Fitchburg, Worcester, Shrewsbury, and Springfield. Um, so we've got four of them, and the Worcester and Springfield populations we actually just found this year for the first time. Uh, what this means is, you know, this, this is what we know. These are the places we know lanternfly is, but they could be out there somewhere somewhere else and we just haven't gotten a report yet. That said, the public does seem to be really good about letting us know when they see them. Um, we've gotten in a ton of reports. Most of the, the areas on this map that are shaded in are reports from the public of somebody finding lanternfly. They tend to recognize it well, and um, so far they've been letting us know when they see it. Okay, so now, what are we doing and some ideas for things that you might be able to do um, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss others that uh, ideas you might have as well. Um, so, so far we have been doing first off a public awareness campaign to um, let people know not just that um, what it looks like, but also that they should report it to us if they see it and how they can do that, particularly uh, we're, we're kind of at the moment trying to push back a little bit against some of the messaging from the other states where they're telling people just to stomp it. Those are areas where they've got just so many lantern flies that they're not even taking reports anymore. For us right now though, having a photo of the lantern fly is much more valuable than someone killing an individual lantern fly. The concern is if they try and crush it, it might hop away. Again, I, I said it before, they're really good hoppers. They're very springy. Uh, I had the worst time trying to get a picture of one in someone's hand because they kept trying to hop away. I wanted the picture for scale, but um, so getting the word out to take a picture, send in a report. We're also doing monitoring throughout the state using trapping, um, but the public reporting seems to be more effective than the trapping so far. We're going to keep doing it, um, but the, the public awareness is in incredibly helpful um, as a, a way to get more eyes out there in the places that we just feasibly can't do trapping everywhere. Um, okay. If we do find a lantern fly, if someone does report it to us, we will uh, go out, see if there seems to be a population there. If there does, we then will survey in the area to try and determine how big the population is, where the edges are. Then we will try and eradicate it or you know, slow the spread of the lantern fly. Uh, eradicating it is ideal, but even if we're just slowing it down, that buys us more time to prepare for it and it buys us more time to um, have the people who are studying it, learn more about it, figure out better ways to manage it. Uh, we are doing a bunch of the different things to do this. Uh, one is egg scraping. So we'll scrape the egg masses off the trees, crush them to kill them. 
Uh, there's also chemical management with insecticides in the places where that's appropriate. We, of course, can't do that everywhere, and it's really going to differ site by site. Um, we did tree removals in the, the Fitchburg site, but I, this isn't going to be appropriate for every place. We, were, we tried it at the Fitchburg site because we'd only found it on a couple trees. Um, they were tree of heaven. Um, and so, you know, we decided, okay, we're going to try removing it, chipping them up really small, see if that gets rid of them. Um, unfortunately, it didn't. There's still lanternfly at that site. And what other, site, um, what other states have been finding too is that tree removals really don't help. Then that's partially because the lanternflies just will lay their eggs on so many different places that even if you get the bulk of them gone, there could be another egg mess you know, hidden on a stone wall, hidden um, on a, a fence post nearby that you just missed. Um, I, I've been out doing uh, at, at some of the surveys for the egg messes. It's, incredible how difficult it is to spot them, even if you're really practiced at seeing them. So it's very easy to miss one, and one is really all you need for the population to keep going. Then finally, we're doing follow-up monitoring. Uh, that's what you can see in these two pictures. The first, uh, the, the photo on top is of a trap tree. We um, put insecticide in that tree. Um, it's, a, it's a trunk injection to you know, limit the amount that we're using. Then we put buckets at the base of the tree. We regularly check those. Um, and so hopefully any lantern fly that feed on the tree will die and fall into those buckets. Um, the other tree shows a sticky band um, and the lantern fly will climb up the tree. They get stuck to the sticky bands. The reason why we have that wire mesh around it is to try and prevent any bycatch. Uh, we really, you know, we just want to catch the lantern fly. We don't want to catch any, any other insects. Um, if you're ever looking into doing uh, the sticky bands on trees for whatever reason, really strongly recommend putting some sort of wire mesh around it. You can find instructions online about exactly how to do this um, because all sorts of things can get caught in them, you know, birds, bats, um, butterflies, uh, other insects, and uh, we really don't want that. We only want to catch the target species. So, um, here are some of the places that if you're trying to monitor for lanternfly eggs, trying to check for lanternfly eggs are worth looking at. Um, they will lay their eggs on trees. Uh, you can see here there's a wide range of how much they blend in depending on the color of the trunk. Uh, with the trees, uh, they will lay their eggs very high up into the trees, so you really need to use binoculars uh, all the way up to the tops of trees. Um, they also will lay their eggs under any sort of curling bark, or if there's a piece of dead bark, they will lay their eggs underneath the bark. Uh, so that's another place to check. Pieces of wood, so that includes benches, that includes firewood, fence posts, anything like that, they'll lay their eggs on them. Um, rocks, metal, and actually the rocks are how it first got into the country in the first place. And you can see, you know, you look at that, you think it's some mud. It, it's very hard to spot. You don't think that's anything at all. Uh, out, outdoor equipment, um, tires, anything they can get to. And here is an example of one of those hidden egg masses. They do really try to hide them inside this cinder block. It's way down there, right inside. Very difficult to spot. Uh, we also get taught uh, asked a lot about whether host plant removal might work. Uh, there's some issues with that for a couple of reasons. First, there are just way too many things that these insects can feed on to be able to feasibly remove all of their host plants. You would have to basically level everything in the area, remove all of the plants, and nobody wants that. Um, they're also very mobile. So even if you did that, they would just come back in from the surrounding area. So that's not really feasible. So, okay, what about Tree of Heaven? They seem to really like Tree of Heaven. Um, it's also invasive, so we don't want it anyway. Um, there's a little bit of evidence that it might make an area somewhat less attractive to lanternfly, but it doesn't make a huge difference. Um, for a while, we thought that maybe maybe they would need it in order to lay their eggs, but no, they can reproduce perfectly fine without Tree of Heaven, unfortunately. Um, and some of some of the issues are this is not going to stop Tree of Heaven permanently, and or excuse me, spotted lanternfly permanently, and Tree of Heaven is very difficult to control. 
Um, if you cut it down, you get a bunch of suckers coming up from the roots and suddenly you have a thicket of tree of heaven. Uh, you really need to um, apply the right um, herbicide or there's a few other methods that you can use to uh, get rid of it. But no matter what you use, you have to keep going year after year after year to really get rid of the tree of heaven. Um, there are also some potential health issues you can run into with removing it. Uh, some people can have an allergic reaction to the sap if it gets on their skin. Um, and in some very rare cases, it can also cause uh, heart issues if people bring, breathe in the, the fumes from the sap. Um, pretty rare, but it's worth mentioning so that people are, are cautious around it. It's something you really have to do your research before you get into removing it. Um, what you can use them for though is potentially for monitoring. They do like it, they tend to go there first. Um, it can be a good way uh, if you're able to, you know, check a few times a year, if you wanna set up something like we did with the buckets at the base of the tree, that's another option um, to see if the spotted lanternfly have showed up on that tree of heaven. Um, if, you, if you do that, if you wanna pair the monitoring with, um, with the removal, uh, what some people will do is they'll leave just a, a single sentinel tree and they'll make sure it's a male tree so that it's not producing seeds that are spreading further. Now, the other thing is, you know, raising more awareness. This has been very, very effective in terms of uh, monitoring for spotted lanternfly. You can order free materials from us. We have mini posters, we have flyers um, that are targeted to a bunch of different industries. There's moving companies, nurseries and landscapers, beekeepers, a driver's checklist. We also now have a recently released homeowners uh, management guide. That'll be more useful once, um, if, although they're, they're spreading so rapidly once, unfortunately spotted lanternfly arrives at that point, that'll be useful, but it is there for um, people to take a look at to kind of prepare ahead of time. Uh, you can also download all of these files on the link on the screen. And I'll also put that in the chat when I'm done. Oh, and we have, we have holographic stickers. It's very exciting. They just arrived. You can put them on water bottles. Uh, they're waterproof. Uh, so we're happy to send those to you as well. If you want to design something of your own, we can provide photos. I'm also happy to read something over to make sure there's, you know, it, it lines up with the messaging we're trying to do and also is, you know, scientifically accurate. Uh, just try and give me a decent amount of time because I'm, very busy at different times of year. And I always think I can predict when it's gonna be and it's different every time. Uh, so the, the messages that we're trying to get out to people are first off, review any recommendations that are for your field. Uh, if somebody is doing any sort of trucking or anything that involves driving around the state or between states, um, try to encourage them to check before they leave and when they arrive. Again, this includes any college students that are traveling back home particularly if they live in a state that has um, high numbers of spotted lanternfly. Um, don't move firewood. It's always a good thing to remember. It applies to spotted lanternfly as well. Um, and then finally, if they think they've seen lanternfly, snap a picture, send us a report. Even if someone isn't sure, we're, we're happy to look at those pictures. I, I'm a bug nerd. If somebody sends me a picture, it turns out not to be lanternfly. It turns out to be some cool native insect. I'm happy. I got to look at a cool native insect. If I can identify it, I try and send people an interesting fact about the bug too. So that's that's totally fine. People shouldn't be hesitant to send in photos. Uh, then finally, we have a newsletter. We send it out once a month. It's five bullet points or less with links out to more information. It's timely forest pest information. And we also include some invasive plant information in there as well. Um, and you can, again, I'll put the link in the chat. And with that, I'll take questions just as my voice is going. Thank you very much. You packed in a lot of information in a short period of time. I will open it to the floor for questions. Sue. So. You're muted, Sue. Sorry about that. I I looked at the, the map you had, the regional map, the dashboard map. It has Northampton as having had a reported spot on lantern fly. And I'm just wondering how that works. Like, did somebody send a picture or 
Rich, do you know about that? Like, mm -hmm. apparently it didn't go through the city in any way, but can you tell us where it was in any fashion? Can you describe the type of site or anything at all? Um, so I don't remember that one specifically. It would have come in to us from a report from the public. I, I might be able to get you some more information about that. Uh, we don't release the exact location because um, we're trying to, you know, make, protect people's privacy. Um, but I will look into it. We generally try and notify the towns once we've received a report like that. Um, so who in a town do you notify? I it's so I I'm I'm not the one who actually sends out those messages, uh, oh, unfortunately. Right. So I don't I don't remember um, who would have been contacted about that. Okay. Thanks. It's a nice dashboard. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think that Rich, you told us about that incident um, a month or two ago. It was a single adult that was on a vehicle. Um, that's all Thanks. we know about it. Sorry, I missed that. On a vehicle. Yeah. So that's that's what we we tend to see for those those single, um, particularly with the adult reports. They tend to be things like they'll they'll be on a vehicle. You know, maybe someone was traveling and it latched on through an infested area. Sometimes they show up in produce, um, or on again live plants. Um, sometimes in in packing material. So occasionally they've shown up where there's been like a, a box that's like sealed all up in plastic and there's a little smushed lantern fly inside mm -hmm. um so they're particularly in the adult stage they're flying around a lot and they can get into things really easily how far can a um would a lantern oh i'm sorry jen you had your hand up first go ahead um i was just wondering is um the staghorn sumac is it staghorn sumac and smooth sumac that it's that the, is a host plant. Mm -hmm. I'm blown that, away that staghorn sumac would be a host plant because they're so hairy and sticky. Yeah, um, that that's a good question. I let me let me find out about that specifically um, because the again that's information that we're getting from Pennsylvania and they've just told us sumac in general. I've been a, a, just assuming that it was all sumac, but now yeah. that you mention it, that does seem like it would be difficult for them to feed on. Yeah, because um, but... they're both native. We have much mm -hmm. more. I mean, the um, uh, Bruce Typhina, the the staghorn sumac, is much more common than uh, mm -hmm. um, Bruce. Uh, is it Glabra? I think it's just smooth. I can't remember the name for smooth sumac, but I, I've honestly been surprised by the number of things that they'll feed on, though things mm -hmm. that have you know, the, the like trichomes and, and other yeah. kinds of defenses that you would think would prevent them from feeding and yeah. they still manage it. But yeah, let me, let me find out about that. Cause that's, that's an interesting, Thanks. that's a good question. Thanks. Um, I have a couple questions. First one is um, besides them getting transported by a vehicle, mm -hmm. do you know how far from the host tree, the adults would lay eggs? It, it varies um, a lot. Um, there's conflicting information about that. Um, some studies say that they, they can't travel very far. You would think they're, they're heavy insects and they're mostly relying on that gliding behavior where they're climbing up tall things and then gliding down. Other people, though, are starting to wonder if they're they're you know catching the wind and are able to travel further because of that. They can certainly hop and crawl pretty far. Um, what I've seen so far, though, would suggest the adults will move a good distance. So that's mm. potentially up to a mile, a little more. Mm. That would not be uncommon. Um, but if there's a female, if she's full of eggs, uh, do I have that picture on my slide set? No, I don't. Okay. Um, when the females are full of eggs, their abdomens swell up. They're very, very heavy. Mm -hmm. So once they've fed, once they've mated and they're getting ready to lay eggs, they're, they're probably not going to travel too far from those trees. Uh, okay. Another question I have is, so let's say um, there's a of occurrence that's spotted and reported to you. Mm -hmm. um, the point of, of 
I can see why it matters as far as monitoring where it is, mm -hmm. but is there anything that is actually going to make a difference in terms of reducing the outbreak in the town? Because there's so many egg masses, you're never going to be able to get them all. It's so, so the idea with, even if you can't eradicate it with trying to knock down the numbers is that you're buying yourself time. So you're buying time both for us to, you know, a few years to develop better management strategies. And there's a lot of work being put into it. And you're also buying time for the people who live in the area and who, you know, they might be um, in one of the industries that could be affected by this to start making plans about how they're going to deal with the spotted lantern fly. So that's, that's the idea of slowing them down. Um, I just remembered, I did also want to mention there's a study that is coming out shortly that I recently saw a presentation on looking at spotted lantern fly in the maple industry. It's a very early study, small study, not a lot of data. We need more information, but lanternfly may be affecting the sugar and starch content in the sap of maple trees. So if you know anyone who's either doing it for a hobby, doing it on a larger scale, it's something that they should be aware of. Hopefully it's going to turn out not to be as big of an issue, but um, there is some data that suggests it, it might cause a problem for those people as well. Could you send that link to Rich? Sure. Yep, article? I can do that. Let me jot this down so I don't forget. <laughs> Great. Write down the sumac too. Okay. Sue. Uh, yes. Sue. Okay. Um, you mentioned apples. It's not really going to damage the tree too much or the or the harvest, it may affect the sugar content in the harvest with apples too, or? Um, I, I haven't seen anyone who's looked into that. Um, they haven't been seeing any major issues with, with apples or other fruit trees in Pennsylvania, and they've been very hard hit for a number of years now. Um, I, I can't guarantee that it won't be a problem, of course, but it, it seems not to be affecting it in a way that would impact the the harvest of the apples themselves or the flavor of the apples and then i guess the follow-up um when you say apples and other fruit trees um the stone fruit trees are you familiar mm -hmm. with anything about any distinction maybe or there there doesn't seem to be an issue for stone fruit either thank you yep and i mean again i i feel like i can't caution this enough because it, it changes year by year yeah. what, what people are just, saying, what people are observing. Um, oh, we get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just curious if you knew anything. Yeah, not there. There doesn't seem to be a big impact based on um, the, the the studies that come up have come out and also the people who are on the ground talking to actual growers in the areas. That's where we're drawing. We're trying to draw information from both of those sources. So Given the fact that it's in Springfield and there's a sustained population, and I know you guys are down there trying to do things mm -hmm. down there, um, and that you know we seem to be on that map in a, in a favorable location, is pretty we should it's pretty likely it's going to end up up here in North at some point. Yeah, I mean it's there's a good chance. I mean I can't say when. Yeah, but based on what we've seen in other states, uh, it, they, they do spread. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, this, it's pretty unlikely to contain it in Springfield. Yes. Yeah. It's here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We're, yeah. We're, we're hoping to delay it. Sure. But, but it's unlikely it's going to be eradicated. And then if we did identify it, and, you know, it turns out we have a population, then you folks would help us to determine the best management strategies to, to, to decide on or given our situation or whatever. Yeah, it, it would, I mean, it would depend how, you know, on a number of factors, it'll depend on how widespread it is at that point um, in terms of what would actually happen um, mm -hmm. as well as what area it showed up in. Um, but we can, we can assist with that information. We can, we can, help with, at the bare minimum, we can help with planning and providing um, 
informational resources, um, whether or not we're able to actually go in and help do some of that management ourselves. Like I said, that's dependent on a, a number of other factors. Uh, if I could ask, yeah, I know it's early days, but could you explain how the native fungi would help stop the spread of the lanternfly? Sure, yeah, it, it, so it, it would be similar to um, with, with the predators um, where the, um, they're, they're actually they're kind of cool, kind of creepy fungus. <laughs> um, they get in the body of one lantern fly, and then that lantern fly dies either still attached to the tree or at the base of the tree, and they produce spores that sort of like poof out and will land on nearby lantern fly. Um, hopefully, that would let it um, spread in that population in that area. Um, so, the, the goal there is to knock down in the population without having to use um, traditional chemical insecticides. Um, but the, it, it's it's really interesting. They're looking at different strains of a few of the fungus, um, fungi in particular, that don't seem to be having a large impact on a lot of native insects in the same way. So I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll be able to find something that we can use and won't affect other bugs that we we want to keep around. Right, thank you. And just one follow-up question. Is there yeah. a college or university that's doing research in, into fungal pathogens? Yes, um, the, the big one is uh, Cornell. Cornell is doing a lot of the research there. Uh, they, let me actually add to the list. There's a really great webinar that one of the speaker or one of the researchers at Cornell did uh, last fall about um, exactly what I'm talking about here, this work that can give you a lot of really good information about it. Um, David, the other thing about like the fungus is that um, if it if eventually we have something, then it becomes endemic in the you don't have to keep applying it, you know, because it's there and then it's they come in and they get knocked down and, you mm -hmm. know, it's happened with um, they don't call it gypsy moth anymore, but it's called spongy moth. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's the same idea as, as with the spongy moth, where um, it's not going to help every year. You're still going to end up with some outbreaks, but at least um, in most years, hopefully the population will be at tolerable levels. Um, so in terms of thinking about what is a best use of our time to deal with this, mm -hmm. do you think that it's worthwhile, A, um, continuing to try to locate where the tree of heavens are in town? I, I think it, 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 it depends on the amount of resources that you have to put into it. Um, I think I would say the first priority would be getting the word out about it, sort of a, more to do with public awareness. Then if you still have time and you can identify where that tree of heaven is, if you can either, um, you know, yourselves or get volunteers to check on them and on the regular basis, prioritizing the ones that are going to be near um, high risk pathways, like if there's mm -hmm. any area where there's, you know, any sort of um, shipments coming in on a regular basis, yeah. uh, uh, highways, things like that. I think those would be good to check, you know, again, if, if you have the resources, I know it's, it's a big undertaking to do. Do you think the best, um, also, so once we know where some of the Atlantis trees are, which we already mm -hmm. know some of them, what would be the best way to monitor them? You know, assuming that the lantern fly would go there first, mm -hmm. um, What's the best way to look for them? Like time of year, should we go now and look for egg masses or should we um, wait until like spring and look for the, um, the the wilting leaves or what do you suggest? Put out um, kind of traps or sticky things, what? So there, there's, there's a few options. Um, looking for uh, signs of honeydew at the base of the tree can be mm. useful. Mm -hmm. um, you need enough lantern fly for that to really show up, of course, or also looking for an odd number of bees when the tree is not flowering. Mm. Is helpful. Um, the adults are the easiest stage to notice. Um, and the adults, just, just because of their size and because of that flight ability, 
uh, the the early nymphs when they're first hatching out in the spring are pretty uh, small and they'll also potentially be dispersing into the undergrowth. So I think that would be hard mm -hmm. to do. Um, the egg masses blend in really well with tree of heaven bark in particular. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah frustratingly well. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, I, it, if somebody is really good at spotting it, certainly that's a good time of year because they're stuck there. They're not moving. Um, but I would say the, the adults are probably going to be the easiest to, to notice. Um, in terms of traps, you can do, you can do the sticky bands, um, that it, there's, you can have mixed results with those. And there is, you have to be aware going in that there's the risk of bycatch. Um, you can also do something like the, the trunk injections using them as a trap tree, like I mentioned earlier, but that's going to depend on how you feel about using an insecticide at any particular site. Um, for that, you just have to go back on a regular basis to monitor those buckets that you've got under the tree. Um, but it's nice because you don't actually have to be there. You don't have to catch them in the moment that they're on the tree. They can be feeding at any time and fall into the buckets. Mm. Um, I think but I understood Molly's question is like, we've mapped a lot of these. She has a nice map mm -hmm. and um, we haven't mapped everything, but wondering like, what can we do right away? Like right now in winter months, we can look for the egg masses. Mm -hmm. And then at what point in the spring could we try putting some sticky traps on trees that we think are in near these transportation corridors? Like, for the life stage of the nymphs, like when, yeah. when would that be? What temperature do they become active, for instance? So the temperature, I don't know off the top of my head. Let me see, did I? No, I didn't write that down. I should have written that down. Um, I, I, I don't know the temperature off the top of my head. However, May or June is when they're first gonna start hatching out. Thanks. Um, yep. So that's when you can start putting out those those sticky bands as it warms up. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Yeah. No. That's just if it's a warm spring, um, you can put them out earlier. If it's a cold spring, you have to wait a little later. Basically. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Questions for Elizabeth. <clears throat> I, uh, I sent you all um, the links that uh, Elizabeth shared on the chat. So you have all those in your inbox email so you can check those out. Um, thank you very much for packing in a lot of information in a short period of time. We really appreciate it. Um, we hope we don't have to reach out to you, but uh, we, we know. Will. Yeah, <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. But we are uh, very grateful for... Uh, all the assistance that MDAR has uh, given the other communities that you've had to deal with. And it's good to know that you're out there to give us uh, a hand and trying to guide us um, through this process. So thank you again. If anyone you. has any follow-up questions, I think you probably, I, you can send them to me or you can, I can share Elizabeth's email address mm -hmm. with all of you as well, which I don't think I, I did, but I'll, I'll do that. Great. Is yeah. the Cornell professor's webinar on your, youtube channel um it's it's not um okay that's I, something you're sending so we'll look forward yep. to that yep um thank you so much for coming oh i'm, I'm happy to come in again if you have any follow-up questions please feel free to send them my way if i don't know the answer i'll try and connect you with someone who can give you an answer great great maybe if we ever organize a um like a neighborhood i mean a, like a citywide um you know a meeting or something would you be willing to present again at that yeah. kind of thing? Great. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great. Thank you. That was really helpful. Thank you. All, all right. Um, we have uh, eight minutes. And we have nothing on the agenda. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add? Um, Molly has. I had something. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, Oh, what was it? Um, it wasn't about spotted lanternfly. It was something else. Uh, now I can't remember what it was. Okay. 
Any other business? I I had a question. You sent out the um, bare root. Uh, well, maybe this isn't a question for you, but anyway, I was just wondering, are, are you working with Rob on, on the, the amounts and. You mean for the spring for the, yeah, uh, I haven't, uh, Rob and I have not had, I, Rob is here. I can see him. I mean, I can't see him, but I know he's there. I can see uh -huh. him. Um, I haven't had a conversation with him about, uh, the bare root stock. We just, we just received, uh, that list I sent you was from Schichtel's, I think. Yeah. Which we've ordered only once in the past. I just got the email from Chestnut Ridge Nursery. Oh, for, that's the other place we. Yeah, for their. Got, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Typically, we would match the sites with possible existing trees we have in the nursery for next spring. Right. Or match new sites with trees that we need to we need to procure from either Amherst Nursery or Chestnut Ridge. Mm -hmm. Um, so Amherst Nursery, we typically would go over and walk around and we tag trees based on mm -hmm. what needed. So, but that's a, that's a conversation we're obviously going to need to have because Rob is uh, going to be semi-retired. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I was asking. I didn't know what. Yeah. No, I, no, we haven't. It's not even the first of the year. Don't stress me out, Jen. All right. All right. All right. Um, oh, I, uh, actually I can update I you. Oh, hi, Rob. Uh, Rob? So to, just Jen, so to get ready for that, um, Alicia and I ha ha will have or should have already had a meeting where we sum up all the tree sites that we didn't have trees for. And that's the kind of starting point. Okay. So, so okay. You know, we'll probably have 40 sites that we don't have stock for. Okay. And um, one of those sites that is... Um, the lead school. And mm. actually, um, if you wanted to work on the lead school with me or with you know with me and Alicia, we have the, we have marked out sort of where they go, but we haven't picked species. Sure. Yeah, and I'll contact you. That'd be great. I think most of those species that we need we don't have at the nursery. Okay. And so um, we'll I'll need 20 or 25 trees for that project. Okay, Are there I'll, any I'll email you to try to set up a time. Good, thank you. Besides thank lead you. school, are there any other community projects worth that are kind of rumbling around? And um, I don't think there are any large community projects that we have. Well, I remembered what I was going to say, and it's related to this. Okay. I was walking today on um, Hillcrest Drive in Florence. It comes off of Bridge Road. And there's um, a lot of wide open space there with no trees on the side with no um, power. Of course, there's no sidewalk either, but maybe we could use the town right away. But I was thinking that might be a good neighborhood to do um, a neighbor led like they did on, um, what was it, Middle Street in Florence? Um, that Meg right. Seiler helped out with. Um, maybe there's a maybe there's a person on that street who would coordinate or be interested in in kind of organizing the neighbors because it would be nice to get neighbor buy-in um, if we're going to be planting on a street where there's no sidewalk, like right on people's lawns that looks like it's on their lawns. So we have not organized yet how we're really going to approach wide-scale planting on streets that don't have uh, sidewalks. Mm. Mm -hmm. there, there needs to be an approach. I think we need to work probably through the ward counselors. We need literature to present mm. uh, people to door hang. In other words, it's, it's, I think um, Middle Street was great, but there um, we had a really wonderful person leading the way. Any neighborhood though that you can find, if you can find a person who lives in the neighborhood who will lead the way and actually make personal contact with each household. How right? did you happen to hook up with Meg Seiler for that project? Well, on streets um, where I just felt there was a, a great need, need for trees, I've been going door to door, just knocking on the door saying, hey, mm. you know, we're growing some trees. and. Uh, when I do that, I meet people and then, you know, 
through development of a relationship. Um, yeah. You know, they, well, they take that on. Um, and it just hasn't happened very much in the more outlying areas that don't have sidewalks. Although- Well, uh, that street it, is a good candidate because it's it's like wide open, pretty much wide open. There, there are actually huge numbers of streets mm -hmm. with no trees and no sidewalks. I mean, just miles of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we should consider door hanger um, yeah, door hangers as, as, to as kind of get a sense of people's um, response, whether they're like interested or interested in leading or if they're against it. Um, as, as a commission, this is definitely the frontier. And I think a, um, and I think Rich and I have discussed this actually at a meeting is that, um, uh-oh, I'm having a, a, a uh, the, the, the tree warden in, in uh, Amherst. Um, Alan. Alan Snow no. um, actually developed a format for, for doing this. Oh. Successfully. So, um, you know, I think I'm somewhat aware of what he did, but don't have the particulars. I think I actually got him to give me the door hanger. You know, he's got a, a way, I don't know if it's a way that would work here where he, he, he puts a, a notice saying we're going to plant. I don't know if he says we're going to plant a tree or, or we're going to plant a particular species of tree, right in front of your house. If you have anything to say about it, give me a call. I think is hmm. what he does. It. And our tree warden Rich has talked about having something. He was talking about maybe something like the power company has, where it's a pouch and they can put it, put something back in, and we pick it up again or. Would say it again, Sue. What? Um, like some kind of a piece that would go on the door, and then you could go back around and get the feedback. Oh. oh. But um, Molly, there was a presentation. I don't know if you were there. Rich and Rob did about these plantings, and the relationships can't be stressed enough. Where Rob really eloquently talked about, I don't know if it was Middle Street knocking on every door and working and not getting anywhere. And then as soon as he got that neighbor on board, boy, it really, it's like night and day. It's the relationship. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's community organizing, but that community organizing could potentially be <laughs> uh, stimulated or helped out by leafletting. Mm -hmm. uh, knocking on doors is kind of hard, actually, sort of. Well, I'd, I'd be interested in talking with you sometime. I mean, now, Maybe, but it's already six o'clock, so probably not now. But about, um, you know, what was your, what was your script when you talked to people when you knocked right. on their doors? Right. And I, um, I, I want to point out that another door, the door that got knocked on was Stoddard, Stoddard. Where oh, that sounds like Susan's neighborhood. Yeah, that's how Sue's neighborhood is lined with trees now. That's why Alicia got in. Alicia and I were next door neighbors, and yeah. Rob came up his street. He's Rob's knocked on probably a thousand doors or more. Well, oh, way, way more than a thousand. Way more than a thousand because we have we're up to a th two thousand trees, and no, no, it's no, just knocking, knocking, and rejection yeah. after rejection. Yeah. And then you find somebody who's willing to talk to their neighbors. So right. you found even though the first neighbors you knocked on said no, I'm not interested, and maybe they didn't even want trees at all. That once. The neighbor who was interested got involved and helped organize. They sort of uh, changed their mind and came around. Right. You can you can knock on uh, many doors, like maybe even dozens, before you get someone interested. Mm -hmm. But if you get someone, like in the case of Sue, she got all her neighbors enthusiastic about it, and we ended up planting many trees on her street, including. Uh, where she's working right now on a project to plant some set, more setback trees on her street. So when There's, you knock on those doors, are you asking the people just how they feel about having trees planted on their street? Or are you asking them, would you like to help organize a neighborhood group to do it? Well, the way that I've, I've worked, especially in, in the, many of the early years, um, was that I was very intent on setback trees. You've heard me talk mm -hmm. about importance many times. So when I'm knocking on a door, usually my purpose was to get a setback tree. And partly that's because I don't like planting 
tree belt trees until I've already found out that people aren't going to take a setback tree. Oh, that's so, the way. So that so okay. often I'll knock on the door and say, hey, you know, I'd love to plant a tree on your lawn. And they'll go, there's no way we're not interested. We're not having it. And then I'll go, well, okay, well, the city might be by to plant some trees in the tree belt. Ah, okay, okay. It's kind of like, because okay. especially in neighborhoods that are most needy of trees. Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, North Street neighborhood is where I've knocked on every. Mm. There, often they don't have a tree belt. And uh, even if they do, it's skimpy. And we do get some setbacks there. Like North Street itself, we have one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We probably managed to plant 14 or 15 trees on setback trees on North Street. Mm -hmm. And then there are very few tree belt trees because there's no tree belt. There may be none. Yeah. Hmm. Well, a useful, a, a worthwhile project this winter might be to draw up a preliminary list of some of those streets that are most naked, you know, most in need of trees. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, we the, could, we could start are, knocking on doors. Yeah, I can't, I can always get confused as to whether Ward six or seven is the most important place. But when you look at the numbers of where we've planted, you'll see that six or seven or six and seven, mm -hmm. I think six are the six least. Six is the one out by Ryan Road. Yeah, I think it's the least planted. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because they don't have tree belts. And so, it, you know, and we've been out there. Right. We planted all streets with tree belts, um, and and you know, th there's been some le less people have been a little less than enthusiastic out there. But um, there, Le Councillor Labarge has really become very much interested in tree planting. She's helped come out and help plant trees. This is a big so. This is big progress in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and having her join with us, so that's really good. Um, it should be followed up with on. I'm totally. Um, on the other hand, you know, a lot of people out there, they their backyards are full of trees, so they don't really see a need for them in the front yard. Mm -hmm. That's part of the problem. Right. Right. Can't. Yeah. Shady it's, streets. That's the that's the benefit. Yeah, but lead school is very. That's well. Oh, yeah. That's Go that's on. a good one. I will uh, just to round up the conversation. I will have the data for this year's tree planting, hopefully done by the end of December, so we Great. can actually see where we're at, what our ward levels are, et cetera. So then we can sort of take an approach from uh, from the point of view of, of uh, where we're lacking in our density plantings. Yeah, it'd be great um, to have the data. That's great. Yeah. Uh, one quick thing, I just wanted to tell you that last week, Jen and I went to um, Pleasant Street to review the tree plantings that were planted as part of the road project. I forgot to mention yeah. this earlier. This was the project that we reviewed as a commission. Um, there were 22 tree plantings there, which is great. Um, however, our, our inspection revealed that about three, over three quarters of the trees were planted incorrectly. Ah. So um, Jen and I made a whole bunch of field notes, and then I transcribed that into a uh, spreadsheet um, with the map that we had, and I sent it off to the um, um, the engineer uh, in charge of the project. So the contractor will have to fix those uh, inaccuracies uh, before the growing season starts in earnest. So I'll keep you posted. Um, Thank you for doing that. Yep, you're welcome. Mainly root flares being too deep or other? Uh, root, uh, root flares being too deep, just uh, too much soil, uh, too much soil on top of the, you know, they just basically, some of the root flares were fine, but they just had a huge, large amount of soil. So they guessed, I think, you know, no wire baskets though, which is good. So that at least got taken care of. We just have to have them adjusted before they start to uh, grow their fibrous root systems in the spring. But, right. um. So, you know, it's a, always a learning process, right? Um, I'm also going to send you an email about carbon sequestration with an article attached to it that I think will, and I'll, just a little blurb and an email that'll sort of, I think, clarify the um, the possible mistake or the possible, whatever was said in the last meeting about carbon sequestration 
versus uh, you know big uh, and large, yeah, big yeah, and yeah. It's from it's from uh, Penn State Extension. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to read out there, but it's interesting. Um, okay, great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Sue. One just last little thought. Um, thanks to Devora for um, meeting with me a couple times and talking about she's helping with some Trina Northampton admin stuff. And in our conversation, she brought up like, what's with the whips? And it kind of got us thinking maybe a possible theme for Arbor Day this year would be, you know, the importance of planting a tiny little tree and how to protect it and some handouts about, you know, how to protect the tree, cheap and easy ways to make those protectors and just try to get people to plant trees in their backyard and, you know, with the goal that they live. Because you know we give out the whips, we have some instructions, but to really do a um, awareness campaign, just a thought about a possible theme. We've done volcano mulching theme and mm -hmm. some other theme setback theme um, for Arbor Day. Which, sorry, I don't want to give you a headache, Rich, but I'm thinking about Arbor Day. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm going to go where Rob's going. Where's Rob going? Uh, <laughs> me in the black. Yeah. The black. <laughs> oh. No, no, I'm just, I'm just. There's Devora. Hi, Devora. Thank you for coming, <laughs> and thanks to Abdulaziz. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Does and anyone, anyone have any uh, anything else they want to add before we call for a adjournment of the meeting? Nothing. Okay, wonderful. Um, I will be in touch about our next meeting and my availability. Um, uh, probably early next week. Um, uh, uh, could I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Mm, uh, second. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion to adjourn the meeting that's been seconded. In, uh, any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Yep. All, Aye. Right. Aye. all right, thank you, uh, everyone.